Guruve Gauda Janjaya Radhika Tadali Krishna Krishna Bhakta Yatad Bhakta Yanamona Maha Vancha Kalpa Truvyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhavacha Patita Nam Pavanevyo Vaishnavevyo Namona Maha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shiva Sari Gauda Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare Dhanavad Pranam devotees So I am uh, completing some of my question and answer sessions um, This is a question that was related to a previous uh, video that I had already done uh, regarding the fall of the jiva but please uh, be patient here and be relieved of any anxiety. This is not another video on the fall of the jiva. I think there's been innumerable presentations on both, side, uh, both sides around this issue. And uh, I myself have, I think, equally contributed to um, trying to establish, according to Guru Sadhana Sastra, the actual Siddhantic perspective on that particular issue. But a devotee asked me about something that I mentioned particularly, which was the psychology of the Bada Jivas in relation to the need to suss out or search out both causation and justification for the status of being an Anadi Bada Jiva. So first, let me give a little bit of a history template, and obviously it's going to cross a little bit of the realm, a little bit of the territory of the issue of falling of the jiva itself, uh, but I don't think there's any other way to get to this point without at least having some background. So of course, the the actual issue has always been if the jiva can fall from the spiritual world or not. Uh, we hopefully have proved sedantically that that is not possible. Uh, other alternatives in relation to not falling from the spiritual world uh, have been given as narratives even by some of our contemporary acharyas, and I've explained the reason why, and I'll reiterate that again uh, a little later on, uh, regarding maybe having come from the Tatashta region, right? The word Tatashta means like a borderline region between the spiritual and material worlds, but then it was, you know, completely concluded by our acharyas and everyone else that there is no such physical locale or even metaphysical locale, so to speak, but that Tatashta re refers to a the nature of being marginal. It is technically called Tatashta Swabhav, and it is adequately dealt with, uh, or fully dealt with, I should say, I don't think adequately is the right word, in Jaiva Dharma of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur in the 15th chapter. He gives several examples in narrative form to explain what is Tatashta Swabhav, or the nature of being marginal. Being marginal means that the jiva has the um, ability to be influenced by either external energy of God or the internal energy of God. So all of these things we've spoken many times in the past. So now having some idea about what it means to be to touch this above, a further question arises. We've already dealt with not falling from a spiritual world, not falling from a locale called to touch this since there is no actual locale like that. But then the question is, then what is the Genesis of the Jiva sojourn in the material world. Uh, we've also pointed out from Bhagavad Gita 1320, Prakritim Purusham Chayeva, Anadi Vidi Uvoyapi. Right? That Sri Vishnu Chakravati Thakur and his tika on that verse poses the question uh, when and how the Jivas have become related with the Avidya Shakti and the material nature. And he says this verse is quoted to, to prove that that relationship between the Purusha and Prakriti, including the Avijja Shakti, is Anadi. Uh, and then, of course, in Srimad Bhagavatam, I think it's 11 uh, 22 10, Anadi Avijja Yukta Sha Purusha Shavir Atmanam, right? Svatona Sambhavanti Anya Ganatua Ganadobavet. This is another verse describing that the nature of the Jiva's Yukta to Avidya is Anadi. Also, hmm, Bhuli Se Jiva, Krishna Anadi Bahirmukh, again, 
on this Bengali verse that the relationship of being Bahir Mukh or turned away from Krishna is Anadi. Jiva Goswami Pad in the first Anuchara Bhakti Sandarbha in Prama, Paramatma Vaibhava Gonani uh, Tatastha Jiva Rupanam Chirekarasanam Anadi Paramatattva Gyanam Samsag Bhava Maya. So in this way, there's unlimited Sastra Praman pointing out that the Anadi uh, nature of the jiva's connection with avidya and the material energy is not coming from a particular genesis. It is anadi. It is without any beginning. And because it is without any beginning, it also is without any particular cause. And therefore, the nature of looking for justification also becomes a, a moot point. Because there is no cause. If something happened and there was a cause, then you'd want to justify why that thing happened. But if there is no cause, then justification then becomes a moot point. Still, built into the nature of the ahamkar of the jiva <coughs> is the tendency for self-interest. Self-interest is at the core of everything related to our being bahimuk or vaimukata towards Krishna, means turned away from Krishna. Every single thing is rooted in self-interest. And the false ego is the armor, for lack of a better word, of self-interest. I've explained before that from the Avidya Shakti comes Asmita. Asmita means I am something, but something other than what I truly am, which is the Das of Krishna. Then a Ahamkara, a false egoism or false conception of being the cause and the doer of my own existence manifest that's called ahamkara and then a particular karmic package comes it's called an upadi so karmana daivana natrena jantur dehopapaktiye this verse i think it's from the third canto bhagavatam describing according to karma and our activities a particular destiny is acquired from one life to another and in that given life there's a particular family race social status and everything else that we acquire that's called an upadi Right? And the false ego nourishes acceptance of this upadi, protects it, uh, <laughs> shelters it, and all kinds of other things. So the question of causation and justification generally arise from the nature of the false ego. Because mm, when it is made clear that the jiva, and let me maybe explain this because this will help to solidify the thread of everything as well. The jiva being of Tatashta Shakti of Bhagavan, right? Because the identity is the Atma. You are an Atma. And Jiva Goswami says in Paramatma Sandhava, Prakti Kshetra, every single Atma is an individual. So they're unlimited Atmas. Those Atmas are the Vibhinaksha, or separated parts and parcels of Bhagavan. Like in the verse, Brahman Vamsa Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhutta Shanatana. That is an eternal distinction uh, between the Lord and his separated parts and parcels. They are constituted of a Shakti called Jiva Shakti. This Jiva Shakti, uh, in its very nature, is Tatashta Swabhav, or marginal. Now, being marginal means one can be influenced by the spiritual energy, as I mentioned earlier, or the material energy. So obviously, in the expanse of all of these Vibhinaksa Tatashta Jivas, there are some jivas which are eternally situated within the spiritual energy and don't have any idea about the material world and have always been fully enveloped in Swarup Shakti, consisting of Samvit, Aladini, and Sandini, and they only know their particular relation of service to Bhagavan. There is no other consciousness that could arise there. You understand? Even in our practice of bhakti, we say the premise of the practice of pure bhakti is anya abhila sunya. I'm leaving out the suffix ita. But anya abhila sunya. To not have any other desire except anukuli and krishna nusilanam. So if that is the genesis of the practice, and that is the modality of the practice, that is the perfection. That anya abhila, there's no other desire in the spiritual realm except all things related to the anukul seva of Krishna. So there is no possibility 
that another kind of desire or influence can come there. We've already thoroughly done that in previous videos, so I'm not going to completely reiterate that. But I'm pointing it out because obviously there are other jivas, being of the touch the swabhav, who have been from anarikal, time without any beginning, influenced by the material energy. So the nature of false ego will present to that jiva why some jivas got the opportunity to be in the spiritual world, which is described as being all blissful, eternal, etc. And I find myself in the temporal world, which has been directly described as Dukkaliyama Shashritam, temporary and miserable, etc. So naturally, the false egoism of the jiva, not seeing themselves as Das of Krishna, looks for first causation. Well, what happened? How did I get here? Because of those jivas being in the eternal status of being related to Bhagavan, I also want that, but how did I end up in this situation? So that causes a search uh, for causation. It, it generates the cause for causation. What happened? And then in looking for that cause, concomitantly we want justification of why whatever happened, happened. Right? Now, mind you, this is all born of the false ego. Because in the concept of dasatva, which is the actual constitutional nature of the jiva, it would easily be reconcilable that if this was Krishna's desire, if this is in fact a leela of Krishna's, and I'll prove that in a minute, then whatever situation I have in relation to the leela of Krishna, right, if I'm geared towards that leela in the mood of service, based in dasatva, there would be no issue with it. You understand? If I'm truly of the nature, I'm the das of Krishna, and this leela is one of Krishna's leelas, and I'm part of that leela, I would not be upset. So first I think we need to do uh, one thing also. And that's clarify why the possibility of thinking of some kind of injustice may have taken place. Because again, there's even descriptions in Sastra of the world being Dukkaliyama Sashritam, miserable, Janma Bhutu Jarabya Adi, there's birth, old age, disease, and death, Aryakmik Adi Baltik Adi, Daivik Plesh, meaning miseries of the body and mind, natural disturbances, misery in relation to others. So we're surrounded by a consciousness of everything being unfavorable or unhappy. And in the midst of that atmosphere, trying to eke out a drop of pleasure somewhere. So obviously, the false ego will, will make the presentation to the intelligence in the mind, why am I under this circumstance? Now, if I don't want to blame God for it, I will look at causation related to myself and then justify it on that basis. So this becomes the template under which all the theories about falling from the spiritual world come about. Well, I was envious, or I had an independent desire, or this or that. So we go through various kinds of conjecture around causation, because then we can say, well, it wasn't Bhagavan's fault, it was my fault, and that's enough to satisfy my need for justification. Right? So that, that's one angle. But if we did not fall from the spiritual world, then it becomes problematic, because now, if I've simply been Anadi Bada, then, and there is no original causation of that, now the, the demand, practically, in the false ego for justification takes place. So until and unless we can separate our self-interest, which is rooted in false ego, from the nature of being the Das of Krishna, in which the very first principle is saranagati, or absolute surrender to the will of the Lord, it will never be able to be justified, why am I here from a Nadikal, and I was not situated in the eternal spiritual nature. It will be impossible to reconcile it. Unless we accept I am the Das of Krishna and I am under the will of the Lord. Now, another problem will arise. Well, if that's the case, it will be hard for me to justify, again, justification comes, justify what I will appear, excuse me, what will appear to be a kind of cruelty on behalf of the Lord. Why would the Lord make an arrangement under which 
some jivas who are as parts and parcels equal to other jivas suffer in the material world while other jivas eternally enjoy bliss in association with him. So now we have to get to the root of why we need to justify it. If all things were equal, in other words, if the material world was equally as blissful as the spiritual world, the need for justification wouldn't arise. And therefore nobody would have any cause for stir, <laughs> right? But because we perceive suffering here, then it becomes an issue that needs to be justified. So now we have to go back and look at the actual context and concept of suffering. So contextually speaking, from the point of view of Bhagavan, is any of his lila imbued with suffering? Obviously, by Siddhanta, the Lord being all blissful, and Advaita and Paratattva not having a duality, which would give rise to happiness and distress, everything is a byproduct of the Lord's internal energy, making it all blissful. Obviously, from the point of view of Bhagavan, whether it is the Vaikuntha Lila or the Shristi Lila of this world, there is no context of suffering. Well, then why would the Lord himself bring up in Bhagavad Gita, for instance, the material world is temporary and suffering? Let's take a closer look at what's being discussed. From the point of view of Bhagavan, again, the energy is not producing suffering. The material energy itself is a Shakti of Bhagavan. So suffering is not in the energy. The Atma has been described in Paramatma Sundarabha. Jiva Goswami gave 21 qualities of the Atma. In those 21 qualities, he mentions it is Chit Anandatmaka. It is conscious and it is Dukkha Pratiyogika. The word Dukkha means misery. Pratiyogi means the antithesis or the opposite. The soul is not only the opposite of misery, but Rasam Evam loved Ananda Bhavati. It has the capacity to experience greater and greater uh, achievements of bliss. So it is, for one, in its very base reality, free from misery. So the misery is not in the Atma, it's not in the Shakti of Bhagavan. Where is the misery? Bayam Dritti Adin Adinivaita Tashat. So duality or in Bhagavad Gita. Duality causes a perception of happiness and distress. That duality is only caused by the vicarious identification of the Atma with the material energy from the perspective of not being the servant of Krishna, but being the enjoy of the material energy. When Bhokta Abhiman, material enjoying energy, comes in the jiva, and it is applied to a vicarious connection with the material energy because asanga hi anyam purusha. The jiva never really touches matter. So it is a vicarious identification. I've given the example before, like watching a movie and identifying with the plot and the characters, you will have emotional states of up and down, happiness, distress, due to the vicarious identification with the movie. In the same way, the atma is vicariously through the uh, perception coming from the material energy and the senses, with the churning of the three modes of material nature, their own karmic unfoldment, and many other people's karmic unfoldment, and is going through an emotional up and down happiness distress based on the fact they're not really part of the material energy, but only vicariously identifying with it. You understand? So that duality of the false identification with the material world is where the misery lies. So if that false vicarious identification is broken, immediately one perceives that they're not suffering. On the other hand, you cannot manipulate the material energy in such a way as to come to that point. Only by disengagement from the material energy can that happen. So when people take up spiritual life, it's not that their self-interest automatically subsides or ceases. Only when a person becomes saranagat, tabakti, does self-interest then become curtailed. So let me explain what I'm saying. If a person could not find the mm, sort of the most fulfilling part of their self-interest in material dealings, 
like this one verse, Moga Shemoga Kamino, Moga Gyanavi Chetasa. That Moga means like frustrated at every turn in the material world. So some people will say, based on that frustration of not finding fulfillment in the material world, I'll take a look at the spiritual world. But when they begin to take a look at the spiritual paradigm, they do so with the same enjoying spirit that they were looking at the material world. So again, there is no idea of surrender to the constitutional reality of being the das of the worshipable object, Krishna, Bhagavan, God, but I'm looking for my own enjoyment in the spiritual paradigm. That leads to the pursuit of jnan or yog or vairagya or various other means of detaching from the material world and finding my own personal self-interest happiness in the spiritual paradigm. So what that does, if someone is successful, is that in fact, they will become free from material influence. But in the spiritual expression, they'll look for their own happiness. This gives rise to two kinds primarily of experience. One is in the absence of the material influence, one will experience the absence of misery in the Atma, just as I spoke earlier. That is called Atma Ananda, the cessation of all misery. The principle in Nirvana, in Buddhism, seeks like that, to just get all cessation of material activities and experience the absence of misery. So this is one aspect of mm, Atma Ananda, tasting the very nature, right, which is also called Swarup, because Swarup has the, the meaning in Sanskrit, it means the nature, it doesn't always mean the Nitya Siddha Swarup in relation to a relation with Krishna, it also means the very nature of the Atma, right? So now experiencing that, a person has Atma Ananda. But the nature of happiness itself is not a static thing. There is no metric for how happy are you. <laughs> you understand? In the material world, yes, because everything in the material world is measurable. One of the meanings of the word Maya is that which can be measured. Right? So, but in the spiritual arena, there is no limit to the unfoldment of Ananda. So what happens is that when a person tastes Atma Ananda, they naturally seek the expansion of Ananda, and that leads them to realize mm, Brahman, the absolute undifferentiated mm, truth, which is imbued because Brahman ohi pratishtaham, it is the actual effulgence of the body of the Lord. At that point, one realizes Brahm Ananda. Now, if the person is not an aparadi. Aparadi here means they don't ascribe to the idea of mayavad because mayavad inherently has an aparad in it. That aparad is that a person believes that the very form of Bhagavan itself, when it enters into the lila of the material world, becomes mixed with the mode of material goodness and therefore is part of maya. So this is called mayavad. Because the transcendental form, activities, and everything else of the Lord, hmm? what is this verse? Janma, karma, chame, dipyam, are all absolute transcendence. There is no scope for it being touched by the material modes of nature, not even the mode of goodness. So it is an inherent apparat in that philosophy that therefore checks any advancement beyond the stage of Atma Ananda. Because even Coming in contact with Brahman is coming in contact with the persona of the Lord in the form of his effulgence. But if we have the mentality that the Lord's form can become Maya, then there's no ability to move beyond the cessation of the material influence uh, and Atmananda to taste what is Brahman. So it's described in scripture, Ye Nevravindakshiri Mukti Maninyas Twai Ashtabhavat Avishud Buddhaya. Avishud means they have not into the position of Sudha Sattva. Avishuddha Buddhaya. Their intelligence still has some contamination. That contamination is the aparad of believing the Lord's form is Maya. You understand? So then there are also many levels of growth within the concept of Ananda prior to praying Seva Ananda. Right? I'm going to just try to make a long story short here. Right? But the point being that if there is self-interest up to the point of Mayavad or up to the point of Brahmavad, it does not reveal the nature of praying Seva to Sri Krishna. 
and therefore uh, self-interest is not only in the material arena but in the spiritual arena as well until a person actually becomes Sadhanagat to the lotus feet of Bhagavan and in that position one's true nature of Dasato can be realized and then Bhagavan will uncover means it will uncover himself and reveal himself to that person who is devoted to Bhagavan right there are many verses which describe this Satvam Vishudam Vasudeva Sabditam Yat Ijate Tatrapum Sam Apavrita in the state of pure consciousness where there's complete surrender this is called also Vasudev the state of consciousness where one is purely surrendered then Bhagavan appears before that person uncovered Apavrita means uncovered you understand? also Krishna says Nam Prakasha Savasha Yog Maya Samamrita so the Lord upon mm, being inspired by devotion based first in Saranagati because Saranagati is not only the first Anga of Bhakti but is the doorway to Bhakti being inspired by that the Lord gradually reveals himself in increments through the process of Bhakti and finally in the Satya of the practice of Bhakti which is called Bhava Vas the Lord reveals himself there may be levels of realization along the way but clearly in Bhava Vas the Lord reveals himself you understand? So, as long as a person maintains a self-interest, then their own, as it's described, self-interest will be prominent. And therefore, one cannot understand or justify, without those other theories I mentioned earlier, why they are anadibada. So now let's come to a conclusion here. It's mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Swamcha vibhi namcha rupa hana vishtar ananta vaikunte brahmananda karena vihar The Lord, who is the Lord of Vaikuntha, Ayoja, Dwaka, Mathura, Braj, right, that same Lord in various forms, swamps, his own forms, has lila or interaction with vibhinamcha, jivas. Both ananta vaikunte in all the different vaikuntha planets as well as brahmanandas. So brahmanandas means the material world. So the Lord enters the Brahmanandas in various incarnations. Uh, first, he creates the worlds. That's called Shristi Lila. That's one Lila. Then, through innumerable Lila avatars, he enters into the material arena to have mm, pastimes with the Vibhinamsa Jivas who are Nadi Bada. You understand? Not only that, but the Lord as Antrayami or Super Soul accompanies the Bada Jiva throughout their sojourn from Anadikal in the material world. So from the perspective of Bhagavan, there is actually a Leela being performed here. And if we will give up self-interest and we'll give up thinking of everything for ourselves and turn towards the service of Bhagavan, that Leela will be seen and there won't be a need to justify being Anadi Bada which therefore will lead to the idea we don't need to create other kinds of conjecture around causation of the jiva being here. One, when we perceive that suffering is coming from the vicarious identification with material energy and attempting to enjoy it. So the suffering is not in the Atman, it's not in the material energy. It's in the perverted connection between the two. So if we surrender to Bhagavan, we're giving up that perverted connection. Therefore, is it really suffering here? And whatever perceived suffering there is, is also spoken. Tate anukampam susamikshamano bunja eva atmakritam vibhakam atmakrit. It is due to the previous position of having tried to enjoy the material world and the karma coming from that, it's called parabdha karma, is playing out. So it's saying, oh, tate anukampam sushamikshamano. Please tolerate that and consider it the Lord's mercy. Because by that, when one becomes unmuk towards Bhagavan, by that tolerance, the Lord becomes pleased. And the Lord minimizes whatever suffering was going to be there for one. And for two, the Lord starts to purify the devotee by that perceived suffering, which is actually the Parabdha Karma playing out. Gradually, gradually, as the devotee's bhajan matures, they don't see the world as a place of suffering. 
They see the, the world as part of the mm, impetus for being completely surrendered to Bhagavan. They see the material world as a mm, past history of mm, avoiding service to the Lord. So all of these things will be nourishing to Bhajan life. Like Bhakti Vinod Thakur singing, Amara Jivan Sadhupapirata Nahiko Punyalesh. And he goes on to describe his attachment to the material world in so many ways. But this is bhajan, this is deep mood of akshay, disparaging mood, right? How I wasted so much time in the material world. So now that very material world, which we formerly had bokta abhiman towards, we now have an attitude, oh, I misused the relationship with the material energy, which should all be offered to Krishna. And now in a deep mood of repentance, I'm doing bhajan. This is all helpful to developing love of God. Therefore, if we are truly looking at how to reconcile and not create opposite Dantic ideas of either falling from the spiritual world or uh, refined conjectured ideas about falling from the uh, Tatasta Shakti or looking for um, and demanding from the basis of false ego an answer to both causation and justification, if we truly surrender and understand the genesis of suffering, I just mentioned being that vicarious connection, right? And understanding the operation of the false ego in fostering and pushing self-interest, giving that up by saranagati, right? Well, because the first anga of saranagati is mentioned in, in Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamita Sindhu. So customly, normally, excuse me, we say that we're talking about saranagati, uh, sankalpa pratikul yashvivajanam, but the way to find out what is anukul and pratikul is guru pad asray. So the anga of bhakti, first anga of bhakti, is the same doorway to bhakti as the principles of saranagati. They're not two separate things. To do anukul and avoid pratikul, to see Rakshishiti Vishwas. How to have Vishwas that Krishna is my protector. Gautave Varnam Tata and my maintainer. How to become Atmanik Shepa Kalpanya. How to become humble. All of this will be learned having taken shelter at the Lotus Vita Shri Guru. Gudu Pad Asrai. Understand? So if, if, if you will take this posture, then it is easily reconcilable that being a Nadi Bada is not a curse, a fault. It doesn't require a causation. It doesn't require now justification. But it can stand as what it is. And then looking back on it in the 16th chapter of Jaiva Dharma, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, now in retrospective uh, look, in a retrospective look, one will think, well, really, what is the harm here? Because in the end, it led to love of God. So what now is the fault, unless there's still a remnant of false ego, what was the problem with the purificatory process that was undergone to come to the point of love of God? What was the problem with the corrective actions of Maya Devi, right, to straighten out my tendency to enjoy illicitly with her, to make me unmuk towards Bhagavan? What was the problem with having to face the reality that I'm not the Bhokta? But that bhokta ram yagya tapasam, Krishna's the bhokta. And I am to be enjoyed. <laughs> you understand? What then becomes the problem with the material energy? If we look at it in that retrospect, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur is saying in the 16th chapter, then we can see, oh, no fault, no need of justification, everything is as it should be. And our only duty then is to convince others of that same fact. <laughs> right? Another interesting point Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur makes is that if you look in any Leela of Bhagavan, there is the quote, perception of suffering. Are the gopis not suffering in separation? Did the Panch Pandavas not suffer uh, through all kinds of political intrigue related to mm, the Kuravas? Mm. Did Prahalad Maharaj not suffer at the hands of Hiranyakasipu? Right? So it did Ram uh, and, 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 and um, not Ram, but didn't Sita Devi even have to suffer, right, in Ram Leela, 
right? So, so, so many of the any Lila you point out, you will find in your associates of Bhagavan, they may undergo some kind of suffering. So now the natural question will come, Makunda, well, in the material world, everything is very blissful, so they're not really suffering. But do we really understand that? Do we really understand how that works? So in Ujjal Nilmani, Sunupa Goswami Pad mentions an interesting thing regarding the stage called Rag. In the stage of Rag, the key element is that it makes what would normally be distress into happiness. The actual verse, Dukkam Adikam Chitte, Shukkatwena Evo Rajayate. What is considered to be Duk becomes Shukkatwena Evo Rajayate. It becomes completely permeated with Shukko happiness. But here he gives in the description, not upon getting that particular cause, so to speak, of the suffering removed, but just on the prospect that this suffering will produce a chance I may see Krishna. He gives the example of Shimati Radhika standing on the very sharp stones of Giriraj Govardhan in the blazing sun. But on the prospect of seeing Krishna, oh, that rag become, I mean that. Dukkha becomes the greatest shukha, happiness. Also, he says that the greatest pain experienced by any chaste woman, right, is to have her chastity challenged, doubted, etc. So, constantly, Radhika, all our sakis, their manjaris, always, especially with Radhika, Kutila, Jatila, are challenging her chastity. This is the most painful thing. But on the prospect of seeing Krishna during any rendezvous, all of that suffering becomes completely joyful. So it's not a question of whether suffering exists within Krishna's Leela. The, the perspective becomes how we are digesting that. That determines whether it is spiritual energy at play or material energy at play. If we're trying to be the enjoyer, the suffering actually produces a form of suffering. If we are only oriented towards the pleasure of Krishna, like the verse mentions about the gopis, atma sukhe duke gopiyo na kare vichar, Krishna shukta, Krishna shukta, uh, hmm, chesta, mano chesta, kare vihar. The only desire of the gopis is they have no interest in their own shukha dukh. Only they're interested in the shukha or happiness of Krishna. This is personified in the end of Gopi Gi. Yate su jatta charanam buru namstaneshu, pita sanai dadim, dadim ahi karakaseshu. In this shlok, it is called a Vasikrita shlok because after hearing that shlok, Krishna, oh, their love for me is so high that they are considering that even their desire to give me pleasure may be causing me pain. This is also one feature of Rudha Mahabhav. It's explained in Ujjalani Muni. Hmm? What is this? Mm. I'm trying to think of the actual verse. But the verse says that even when there is the idea that the beloved is suffering, but tatsuke, uh, tatsuke api sankaya, but a doubt arises, are they actually suffering or not? This is in Rudra Mahabhav. You understand? So the gopi's love was so high, it produced Though Krishna is happy to place his foot on our hearts, we're thinking, oh, our hearts are so hard because we're making Krishna walk. Huh? Hmm. 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 What is this? Oh. We are so worried that Krishna is stepping on very sharp stones. So now we think because we've caused that, because Krishna is going deeper into the forest, because we're searching for him, that our hearts are so hard that even if Krishna was to have the satisfaction of placing his feet on our hearts, oh, our hearts are too hard. You understand? So they have no conception of self-interest. And what determines what they're suffering or not suffering is based in that reality. So if we'll do Saranagati, you understand? If we will genuinely do Saranagati, we will have the spirit that though what we're experiencing in the material world is the residue of our Parabdha Karma, right? There is no 
original causation or injustice on behalf of Bhagavan that he placed so many jivas within the uh, realm of the material energy from Anadikal. Because from his perspective, this is also one Leela. Bhakti Vinoda again in 16th chapter says, there's so many leelas of Bhagavan, why should this leela be ignored? So hopefully I've spoken these things so that there can be some understanding of why, first of all, there is the question that arises. Well, how did we fall, who we fall? And the, that whole genesis of that whole perspective comes from self-interest. Do you understand? If we will actually turn towards serving Krishna, means being the das of Krishna, in dasatwa, if the master wanted to use me in any way, form, or fashion, would that not be my greatest happiness? And if it's not, then it means there's still some vestige of self-interest there. Because I'm not interested actually only in the master's happiness, there is a, another desire, and that's against the principle of bhakti. Anya abhilas, another desire would indicate it's not pure bhakti. You understand? And so I've already gone over the different iterations of self-interest even into the spiritual paradigm. But my concluding point here was that in the absence of self-interest, the question would not even arise or it would be reconciled more accurately. Not that it wouldn't arise, but you'd be able to reconcile it. And you would not need to reconcile it by going into opposite dantic ideas like we fell out of the spiritual world in a relationship with Krishna because that's opposite danta. Or the idea that we fell from a tatashta region which was simply um, a sort of ontological expression to describe uh, how the jivas, mm, being of the nature of Tatashta Swabhav, are overcome by the material energy. It wasn't a historical uh, narration of something that happened. And certainly the opposite-dantic idea of any narrative concerning falling out of the spiritual world in a relationship with Krishna is straight-out opposite-dantic. All right. So hopefully this was somewhat helpful. Uh, I would suggest probably listening to it again and again because sometimes I ramble. Hopefully not so much here. I was able to get the point across. Uh, I'm praying for the mercy of all the Vaishnavas and uh, especially our Guru Vargas and the Lotus Vita Sri Sachin and then go to Hari, my Takaji, Shishi Goa Gadara, Shishi Rada Balabju, and Giri Raj, and my Dandavats to all the devotees. Vancha Kalpa Turavisha. Kripa Shindavayavacha Patitanam Pavanavyu Vaishnavayavyu Namo Namaha Jai Radhe Radhe